Good morning. A fantastic storm is on its way in. So I found us a beautiful place for me to read to you. The birds are pretty loud. Thank you for being with me. Chapter 8, Living Authentically. I'm still seat belted in. Parked and safe, but I tucked in my seat belt. All right, Living Authentically. The lies most devastating to our self-esteem are not so much the lies we tell as the lies we live we live in a lie when we misrepresent the reality of our experience or the truth of our being. Thus, I am living a lie when I pretend a love I do not feel, when I pretend an indifference I do not feel, when I present myself as more than I am when I present myself as less than I am. When I say I am angry, and the truth is I am afraid. When I pretend to be helpless, and the truth is I am manipulative. When I deny and conceal my excitement about life. When I affect a blindness that denies my awareness when I affect a knowledgeability I do not possess, when I laugh when I need to cry, when I spend unnecessary stretches of time with people I dislike, when I present myself as the embodiment of values I do not feel or hold, when I am kind to everyone except the persons I profess to love, when I fake beliefs to win acceptance, when I fake modesty, when I fake arrogance, when I allow my silence to imply agreement with convictions I do not share, when I profess to admire one kind of person while consistently sleeping with another. Good self-esteem demands congruence which means that the self within and the self manifested in the world be in accord, which is fancy for saying they have to match. The self within and the self that everybody else sees have to match. I'm gonna throw in a little crystal here. I think that includes Facebook. Okay, here we go. If I choose to fake the reality of my person I do so to mislead the consciousness of others as well as mine own. I do so because I feel or believe that who I really am is not acceptable. I value a delusion in someone else's mind above my own knowledge of the truth. The penalty is that I go through life with a tormented sense of being an imposter. This means, among other things, that I sentence myself to the anxiety of wondering when I will be found out. First, I reject myself. That is implicit in living lies and faking the truth of who I am. Then I go around feeling rejected by others or looking for possible signs of rejection, which I am typically quick to find. I imagine that the problem is between myself and other people. I do not grasp that the worst of what I fear from others, I have already done to myself. Honesty consists of respecting the difference between the real and the unreal and of not seeking to gain values by means of faking reality. That is, not seeking to accomplish my goals 
by pretending that the truth is other than what it is. When we attempt to live unauthentically, we are always our own first victim. Since the fraud is ultimately directed at ourselves, that the ordinary lies of everyday life are detrimental to self-esteem is obvious. No, I didn't have a third piece of strawberry shortcake. No, I didn't sleep with so-and-so. No, I didn't take the money. No, I didn't fake the test results. And so on. The implication is always that the truth is shameful or worse than shameful. That is the message we transmit to ourselves when we tell such lies. But this is the obvious level of dishonesty. Here we must consider dishonesty of a much deeper kind the kind so intimately wedded, so we feel, to our survival that relinquishing it usually is usually a more formidable challenge. To avoid a possible misunderstanding, appreciate live it, that living authentically does not mean compulsive truth-telling. It does not mean announcing every possible thought, feeling, or action, regardless of context, appropriateness, or relevance. It does not mean volunteering private truths indiscriminately. It does not mean offering unsolicited opinions about other people's appearance or offering exhaustive critiques necessarily, even when solicited. Whew. Once again, that's a lot of words. And I think, you know, again, this book's from um, the 80s. Um, that is 1980s, not 1880s. Um, it seems like uh, a lot of this stuff is uh, what the whole point of um, social media. <laughs> so uh, they had no idea when they were writing this. It does not mean volunteering information about hidden jewels to a burglar. I love that. Okay, here we go. On the other hand, we must recognize that most of us have been encouraged to be confused about living authentically, almost from the day we were born. Most of us were raised and educated in ways that make an appreciation of authenticity difficult. <clears throat> Excuse me. We learned very early to deny what we are feeling, to wear a mask, and ultimately to lose contact with many aspects of our inner selves. We became unconscious of much of our inner selves in the name of adjustment to the world around us. Our elders encouraged us to disown fear, anger, and pain because such feelings made to them uncomfortable. Often they didn't know how to respond when the pretense of family harmony was shattered. Many of us were also encouraged to hide and eventually extinguish our excitement. It got on their nerves. It made our elders unpleasantly aware of what they surrendered long ago. Excitement disrupts routine. Emotionally remote and inhibited parents tend to raise emotionally remote and inhibited children, not only through their explicit communication, but through their own behavior. 
which proclaims to the child what is proper, appropriate, and socially acceptable. Further, since so much in childhood is frightening, bewildering, painful, and frustrating, we learn emotional repression as a defense mechanism as a way of making life more tolerable. We learn all too quickly how to avoid the nightmare. In order to survive, we learn to play dead. Playing dead is so common that we generally find it a normal and even desirable state of affairs. It is the familiar, the comfortable, whereas aliveness can feel strange, even disorienting. And yet playing dead is a policy of self-rejection and self-estrangement. One of the most painful and disorienting experiences of childhood that people are driven to repress is the realization that most adults are liars this, too, may become a barrier to understanding and valuing authenticity. I hear mother lecture me on the virtue of honesty, and then I hear her lie to father. Father announces how much he despises someone, and then later proceeds to flatter that person all through dinner. I see a teacher flagrantly deny the truth to another student rather than acknowledge that she, the teacher, made a mistake. To my knowledge, no psychologist has ever studied the traumatic impact on young people of the magnitude of lying among adults. And yet, when I raise the issue in therapy and invite my clients to explore it, most of them maintain that it was among the most quietly devastating of all early experiences. Huh. That's, that's probably true. I would have to say that I've heard many, many stories from friends and family over the years about when they caught somebody lying. Huh. That's interesting. I didn't I didn't realize that. All right, I continue. Many young people conclude that growing up means learning to accept lying as normal. That is accepting and embracing unreality as a way of life. But if we permit ourselves this form of mind sacrifice, if we allow ourselves to be ruled by fear, if we attach more importance to what other people believe than to what we know to be true, if we value belonging above being, we will not attain authenticity. I don't know what happened there. I was just uh, trying to see if there was a, scu a scuffle going on. Scuffle. All right. I'm just gonna read that over again, minus the honking. But if we permit ourselves this form of mind sacrifice, if we allow ourselves to be ruled by fear, if we attach more importance to what other people believe than to what we know to be true, if we value belonging over being, we will not attain authenticity. To attain it, courage and independence are needed. 
especially since we encounter these qualities so rarely in others. But this should not deter us. If the people who are, who are authentic are a minority, so are the people who are happy. So are the people who have good self-esteem. And so are the people who know how to love. While the quality of their relationships is clearly superior to that of persons of low self-esteem, high self-esteem men and women are far from universally liked. Being more independent than the average, they are more outspoken. They are more open about their thoughts and feelings. If they are happy and excited, they are not afraid to show it. If they are suffering, they do not feel obliged to fake nice. If they hold unpopular opinions, they express them nonetheless. They are healthily self-assertive. And because they are not afraid to be who they are, to live authentically, they sometimes arouse the envy and hostility of those more bound by convention. Sometimes in their innocence, they are astonished by this response and sometimes they may feel hurt by it, but they are not led to surrender their own commitment to truth because of it. They do not value the good opinion of others above their own self-esteem. They merely learn that there are people whom it is best to avoid. They seek out nurturing relationships rather than noxious ones in contrast to low self-esteem persons who seem almost always to end up in noxious relationships. The relationships of high self-esteem persons are characterized by higher than average degrees of benevolence, respect, and mutually supported dignity. Growth-oriented men and women tend to support the growth aspirations of others. Persons who enjoy their own excitement enjoy the excitement of others. Persons who practice straight talk and appreciate straight talk in those they deal with Persons who feel comfortable saying yes when they want to say yes and no when they want to say no. Respect the rights of others to do likewise. Persons who are authentic make the best, most trustworthy friends because others know where they stand with them and because such persons inspire others to match their authenticity. In being authentic, we not only honor ourselves, we offer a gift to whomever we deal with. Okay. Here's a couple of little, let's see, little, little different paragraphs. Sometimes I give people a false impression of what I feel, said a client who complained that no one understood her. When I smile and inside I'm crying, when I try to impress people I do not respect, when I deny my anger and smolder inside, when I pretend that nothing bothers me, when I do not confront anybody about anything, when I appear to agree with whomever is speaking, when I don't say what I want, when I say yes, when I want to say no. Okay, here's another one. Sometimes I make it hard for people to give me what I want, said a client who complained that no one cared about his desires. When I don't tell them what I want, when I pretend I don't want anything, when I act like I'm totally self-sufficient, when I subtly sneer at people's efforts to be good to me, when I criticize everything, when I give and give to other people and use that giving to keep them at a distance, 
when I act remote, when I won't stand still when people are trying to reach out to me, when I won't even let myself know what I want. And the next one. If I were willing to say no when I want to say no, said a woman who complained that people took advantage of her, I'd have more self-respect. I wonder if people would like me. I'd feel cleaner. I would have more time to do the things I want. I wouldn't resent people. I would be kinder. I wouldn't rebel and say no over such petty things. People wouldn't know me. I think overall, I would be more generous. I couldn't feel like a martyr. I'd be responsible for what happened to me. I couldn't blame anyone. It would all be up to me. I couldn't feel sorry for myself. I'd have dignity. And the next. If I said yes when I wanted to say yes, said a man who complained that his wife, his life was boring, I'd have more courage. I'd be taking more risks. I'd have to let people know who I am. I'd have to be honest about the things I care about. I'd reach out to people more often. I would have adventures. I wouldn't be so self-protective. I wouldn't be so cautious. I'd be a participant in life rather than an observer. More of me would be in reality. And the next. If I am not here to live up to someone else's expectations, said a woman over preoccupied with gaining others' approval. I'd tell people what I really think and feel. I'd have to find my own direction. I'd have to stand up for myself. I'd have to take responsibility for my own life. I'd find out who my friends really are. Maybe I can belong to myself. It's time to ask myself what I think is important. And the next. If I were more honest about my thoughts and opinions, said a man who complained of social anxiety. I wonder how people would act. I think I would feel more secure. I know I would feel stronger. I would be more relaxed. I would not feel so intimidated. I like myself more. I trust myself more. I wouldn't worry so much about other people's opinions. I'd be less anxious. I wouldn't feel like a second class citizen. I'd know I was a member of the human race. And the next. I think this is the last one. <clears throat> okay, hang on. Let me get a little break. If I were more honest about what I feel, said a woman who complained of having no identity, I'd have to know what I feel. I think people would have more respect for me. I would have more respect for myself. I'd have to face disapproval sometimes. I would probably lose some friends. I wouldn't always be tiptoeing around other people's feelings. I'd have more integrity. I have to change my life. I wouldn't say I don't know who I am. I'd feel I have a center. I'd feel there's something to me. I wouldn't feel so empty. I wouldn't feel so phony. It would be scary. I'd be myself. I'd have a self. In thinking about the issues of living authentically, here are some basic questions to consider. There is some overlapping among them. Right, let's see if I can slip this off here. Am I generally honest with myself about what I am feeling? Ex 
accepting my emotions, experiencing them without necessarily being compelled to act on them. Am I generally honest with others about my feelings in context? Contexts where talking about feelings is appropriate. Am I generally honest with others about my feelings in contexts where talking about feelings is appropriate? Do I consciously strive to be truthful and accurate in my communication? Do I talk comfortably, openly, and straightforwardly about that which I love, admire, and enjoy? The essence of gratitude. <laughs> if I am hurt, angry, or upset, do I talk about this with honesty and dignity? Do I stick up for myself and honor my needs and interests? Do I allow other people to see my excitement? If I know I am wrong, do I acknowledge this simply and candidly? Do I feel that the self I experience internally is the self I present to the world? <clears throat> Excuse me. Using, once again, a scale from 1 to 10, with 10 representing optimal authenticity and 1 representing the lowest level conceivable. Rate yourself on each of these items. Of course, your willingness to be authentic will be challenged in how you rate yourself. Perhaps you will see more clearly the areas in which you are inadequately self-assertive. Next, take a few minutes to sit quietly alone and meditate on the lies you are presently living. Do so without self-reproach. The purpose of this exercise is not to evoke guilt, but to achieve greater clarity and self-understanding as a prelude to enhanced authenticity of being. Imagine you are telling your story to a loving and compassionate friend who genuinely wants to understand you, wants to know why it feels so necessary or desirable for you to live this particular lie or lies. Tell your friend what you feel to be the functional utility, the survival value of your lack of authenticity. Then imagine that your friend invites you to explore your fantasies of what would happen if you gave up living this lie spell out in detail what you imagine would happen. Then imagine your friend asking if there are any conditions or circumstances under which you can see yourself being more authentic in this area and answer. Then sit quietly and imagine how you might feel, how you might experience yourself if you choose to live, if you chose to live more authentically, take the time to think this through. Do this exercise for 10 minutes once a week for two months. And I can virtually guarantee that living more authentically will feel more and more natural and more and more desirable and that you will feel less anxious and more self-confident. You can explore this territory further via sentence completion. 
writing six to ten endings for each of the following. First one, the hard thing about being honest with myself about what I'm feeling is, the hard thing about being honest with others about my feelings is, if I strived to be true and accurate in my communications, if I talked openly about the things I love admire and enjoy. If I were honest about feeling hurt, angry, or upset. If I were willing to show others my excitement. If I were honest about it when I knew I was wrong. If I were willing to let people hear the music inside of me. When I think of what I surrender for fear of being condemned. When I think of what I surrender for fear of being laughed at. If I were willing to experiment with being a little more authentic every day. No one leaps from being relatively unauthentic to being relatively authentic in a moment. That is the significance of the last stem. The question is, are you willing to discover what happens if, step by step, you experiment with raising the level of your authenticity. Inside, we do not respect ourselves for our lapses of authenticity. A bad taste is left in the soul. We sense that a betrayal is involved and we are right. But if we are unwilling to confront the issue, we try for a loser's consolation I couldn't help it. Or we say, it's easy for so-and-so to be honest and straightforward since he has such good self-esteem. I don't. We forget the fact that living authentically is one of the ways we cultivate self-esteem. To assert our own wants and needs without expecting, of course, that anyone else be responsible for their fulfillment, even when it is difficult to do so. This is what our self-esteem asks of us. Yes, to tell the truth about what we think and feel without knowing in advance how others will respond. Yes, to allow others to see and know who we are Yes, to remain loyal to our own consciousness, even if we are alone, to see what we see and know what we know. Yes, this is the heroism of honoring the self. It is also the path to high self-esteem. But wait, looking back at the distance you have come since you began reading, you may be tempted to protest. I didn't think I would have to do so much. Perhaps you imagined that all you would be asked to do is utter a few pleasant affirmations every day and your self-esteem would blossom. That is the kind of attitude that virtually guarantees inadequate self-esteem. 
life, quoting Anne Rand. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh my goodness. Life, quoting Anne Rand, is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action, and every value pertaining to life requires continuous actions to support and maintain it. You cannot put food in your mouth or sustain a successful enterprise merely <coughs> by uttering affirmations. <coughs> Neither can you sustain a high level of self-esteem. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for being with me. I appreciate you.